We're continuing our Follow Me series, and we'll be in Matthew chapter 9. Matthew chapter 9. <clears throat> Amazing uh, revelation this has been that, that um, Jesus proclaims, Follow Me, at the beginning of this book of Matthew, and then continues to, step by step, lead about his disciples in this journey. Even in, uh, we'll be in Matthew chapter 10, in the title of my Bible here, it says, The Apostles Are Instructed. And so, even whoever decided to uh, title these pages got that idea from it. So that's a blessing, and um, let's uh, go to Matthew chapter 10. But first I'm going to look just before that, at the end of chapter 9. Today we're talking about follow me forth, or follow me forward, if you will. Pressing on. Matthew chapter 9, and in verse 36, the Bible reads, But when he saw the multitudes, he was moved with compassion on them, because they fainted and were scattered abroad as sheep having no shepherd. And so right away you see that Jesus' heart for the multitudes is there ones without shepherd. And that's what I believe is, is the, the beating heart of Jesus leading his disciples is that he would take these 12 men and make them into shepherds. And therefore the multitude wouldn't eventually have to always come to Jesus as he walked this earth to hear the teaching. But eventually, each one of these apostles or disciples would become shepherds of themselves, leading about groups of these multitudes. And so they wouldn't be this great horde of people, always following after Jesus and clamoring to get a piece of him, but rather they could go to each one of these individuals and be taught of the same things. So Jesus here has compassion. They fainted. They're scattered abroad, and they are sheep having no shepherd. And so he says in verse 37, Then saith he unto his disciples, so he turns his gaze from the multitudes over to his disciples as he's off to do so far in this chapter, or in this book rather, and he says to them, The harvest truly is plenteous, but the laborers are few. Pray ye therefore the Lord of the harvest that he will send forth laborers into his harvest. He's saying there's a multitude here ready to be harvested, ready to, ready to be plucked up and, and used for their intended purpose, but there's no laborers to bring them in. So they'll be out there fainting, scattered abroad. Who will collect them? Who will draw them in? Who will take care of them? Jesus says the laborers are few, but truly this harvest is plenteous. Pray there for the Lord of harvest that he would send forth laborers into his harvest. And we use that often as a soul winning verse, but here in the context, he's talking about how they have no shepherd. The laborers that he's looking for then are shepherds of these flocks, or would be flocks rather. He wants somebody to be able to take those that are saved through the next step in the Great Commission, which is to teach them all things whatsoever Christ has taught them. He wants, then, teachers. He wants laborers. Continuing in verse 1 of chapter 10, of course, he wants these laborers to submit to him. And the interesting thing is, there comes a perk with submitting to the call of God. Deciding to be a laborer in his, in his multitude, in his army, in his his group, and we're going to see that there is a special care and provision that is unmatched and miraculous when you decide to accept the call to be a laborer for Christ. In chapter 1, first thing Jesus does to his disciples after saying, hey, pray there would be more of you willing to go. He looks to his disciples, and in verse 1 it says, and when he had called unto him his 12 disciples, he gave them power. What a great statement there. What a great gift. He gave them power. It says here, against unclean spirits, to cast them out, and to heal all manner of sicknesses and all manner of disease. I think sometimes when we read this, and I know I've done it myself, I focus on 
what he gave them power to do. And there's the, the, the demonic uh, casting out, uh, the healing of ailments and diseases. But the important focus there of verse 1 is that he gave them power. Their power was specified here. What is our power? What power has Christ given us? Because he certainly has. If you decide to be a laborer in the Lord's service and do his will, Christ will give you power. What that power is? Who knows? It's to be determined. But power nonetheless. We'll continue on. And in verse 2, it says, Now the names of the twelve apostles are these. And I like that. I just noticed. He, event, he initially called the twelve disciples, and now the Bible narrator says the twelve apostles were named this. Just an interesting note that that here seems to be at least interchangeable. Perhaps that because they're on their way to becoming... Um, fulfilling their their service of apostle or or disciple i don't know why that is or why that uh, caught my attention nevertheless it did it says are these here are the names of them the first simon who is called peter and andrew his brother james the son of zebedee and john his brother philip and bartholomew thomas and matthew the publican james the son of alphaeus and labaeus whose surname was thaddeus Simon the Canaanite, and Judas Iscariot, who also betrayed him. Now the twelve here received power. Notice that. He says he called the twelve disciples and gave them power. The names of the twelve apostles are these. So who received power but the twelve that are here? It's just an interesting to note that Judas was among them. Is he not numbered? <clears throat> Judas then has received power of God. Can an unbeliever then, because the Bible records he was a devil from the beginning, can an unbeliever receive power of God? I believe the context here is indicating yes. Can they do the work of God? I believe also there's a big perhaps there. Because the one thing that we need to recognize about Judas as he's numbered among the disciples is the Bible goes out of its way in all the Gospels to give that little addendum when he's named at the end there of verse four it says judas iscariot who also betrayed him it's almost like that reminder always has to be placed there just so we remember i think that's an indication that perhaps the disciples had no idea and, and they would have needed to be reminded that as they went along in the story which is now being recorded for us they needed as we needed constant reminders of who betrayed him what I think that is an indication of is that Judas was very convincing when it comes to being a disciple or being an apostle following after Christ at this time. Um, take that for what it's worth, but when all of the apostles sat around at meat at the Last Supper and Jesus said to them very plainly, as the Bible records here, one of you shall betray me, all of them looked to themselves and said, is it I, is it I? Now, were these guys just wonderful Christians? And the first thing that they did when, when met with a charge from the Lord or from his word, they, they automatically reflect. I believe that's a good example of what we ought to do. When the Bible hits us with something, don't first look to our neighbor and say, that's about you. First thing we ought to do when we hear the Bible preach is say, ooh, is that about me? Certainly that could be about me. And start to apply these things to ourselves. Is it I? Is it I? Is it I? But I also think that it's indicating that when Jesus announced the betrayal, Judas at that time was showing forth the same works, the same walk, the same words as all the other disciples around him, though we know that he was a devil from the beginning. It's just interesting to know. We often think that we can just spot and pick out and, 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 and nail and, and stamp, that guy's the devil. He's the betrayer. He's the bad guy in the church. He's the one that's going to be the Judas Iscariot. But I don't think the Bible indicates that. I think Judas was so convincing in his walk with Christ, though he did believe not on Christ, that there really was no indication. And he also received power, and he also likely went in the ministry door to door to door to door with the disciples, went about healing, went about casting out, perhaps, went about doing all of the things that the other disciples would do in as much as they would look to themselves and say, is it I that betrayed? No one's saying, oh, it's totally Judas. They, they just could not have that foresight because his works showed righteousness, though his heart was wicked and damned and condemned and on its way to hell. 
Just interesting to note. Just a point to note there is that, is that we can't always tell what's in a man's heart based on his outward works. Okay? Now, we continue on. After these apostles were named, verse 5, it says, These twelve Jesus sent forth and commanded them. So, he sent them out in this journey and commanded them to go into a specific group of people. Watch this. Go not into the way of the Gentiles, and into any city of the Samaritans enter ye not. So, go not to where... Um, where there would be Gentile groups or Samaritan groups, which were basically a mixed multitude. They were, they were Gentiles uh, by birth, perhaps, or, or mix of both, but they adopted some of the Gentile behaviors and some of the Jewish behaviors, and so they were a mixed group. Jesus says, go not toward them, but, verse 6, go rather to the lost sheep of the house of of Israel. So very clearly he says you have a specified group of people that you need to reach, the lost sheep of the house of Israel. He says as you go then, here are his commands to them. Verse 7, preach saying the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Amazing. In chapter 3 and verse 2, you don't need to go there. John the Baptist came out and began his ministry preaching the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Another chapter later, in 4 and verse 17, Jesus begins his ministry after his temptation with the devil, saying, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And when Jesus sends his disciples to go to the lost sheep of the house of Israel, in that same fashion, he says, go preach the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And then gives them special provision to perform and special power to do an extra thing. And it's verse 8 records, heal the sick. Cleanse the lepers, raise the dead, cast out devils. Freely ye have received, freely give. So here Christ's command is, go to this group of people, and as you go, preach and give. Notice that. It says heal the sick. Yes, it says cleanse the lepers. But what is that referring to? Raising the dead, casting out devils? He says give. As you've received, give. As you have received power to do these things, so give. And I believe we have the exact same command and charge this day. While we don't see these healing of sicknesses and lepers cleansed and dead raised to life and devils cast out, maybe that's just not at this time, but maybe that day is coming down the line. If that's not the case, and we'll never see those great miracles done by disciples of Christ, people following after him and doing the labors that he intended, then perhaps it's good enough for us to see that Christ commanded his disciples when they first went to go and preach the kingdom and to give. And so we should have and adopt that same charge. What we're giving, again, is it monetary? Is it time? Is it effort? Is it love? Is it, is it grace to people? Whatever it is, we're to be giving people. And as we go, we give and we preach the specific message. And provision will be along the way. Watch this. He says, go forth, give, and preach. In verse 9, it says, provide neither gold nor silver nor brass in your purses, nor scrip for your journey, and that's paper money, neither two coats, neither shoes, nor yet staves, for the workman is worthy of his meat. Now, when we think of meat, we just think of food, right? You slay an animal, there's meat. The Bible also refers to as bread as meat, but here there's another meat being mentioned, and that is money and extra clothes. Just provision. Christ says, don't bring it with you. You don't need to bring anything with you. Why? Because the workman is worthy of his meat. The laborer that goes into the harvest is certainly worthy of his meat. And we need to start grabbing hold of some of these concepts. The days of few are coming. I believe famine is on the horizon. I believe lack is on the horizon from a worldly standpoint. But as believers, we need to understand that what Christ is teaching here is pivotal to those times when you have nothing. Labor for him. Go and preach to the people that he sends you to and give. It's so hard to be giving when we have much. How can we be giving when we have much lack? And we're, we're in need and we're, we're, we don't have gold. We don't have silver. We don't have brass. We don't have any coats for our journey. No script. We don't have extra shoes or staves. We have nothing but what's on us. 
And what's on us is not much. And Christ says, you'll be provided for then. The workman is worthy of his meat. So what do we need to do when times get tough? When we're without a job? When we're without food on the table? When we're without money in the bank or in our pockets? What do we need to do? Work for Christ. Labor in his vineyard, and he will certainly provide you, for you the meat that you need. Here the meat is money, and it's extra clothes. The next thing he mentions in verse 11, it says, Into whatsoever city or town ye shall enter, inquire who in it is worthy, and there abide till ye go thence. And when ye come into an house, salute it. And if the house be worthy, let your peace come upon it. But if it be not worthy, let your peace return unto you. Here another thing he's promising for those that at this time are laboring in his vineyard, following after him, going in his commandments, preaching, giving, doing according to the ministry that Christ gave them. They don't have gold. They don't have brass. They don't have provision or extra coats or extra clothes. And here he says, don't even worry about where you're going to stay, where you're going to find shelter. He says, go into a town, inquire who is worthy and there abide till you go thence. Go in and inquire and talk to people and, and see people and minister to people and give to people and preach the gospel and you will find someone worthy that will allow you to come in and abide until you go hence, as long as you need to. As, uh, you will be provided shelter. Here Christ is saying and sending purposely his disciples out with nothing. And he's saying, you'll have money. You'll have clothes. You'll have shelter. Some good practical things to start considering. Follow Jesus forward. Even when sometimes it seems we have lack of, of what we need to do it. Next, verse 14, it says, I believe what he's providing is recompense. Verse 14, it says, And whosoever shall not receive you, nor hear your words, when ye depart out of that house or city, shake off the dust of your feet. Verily I say unto you, it shall be more tolerable for the land of Sodom and Gomorrah in the day of judgment than for that city. He says, carry on, go forward. When you come into a house, if it be not worthy, kick off the dust of your feet and carry on. Just keep on going, keep on going forward, and let God deal with the judgment of those that would reject you and reject your words. Depart out of that house, depart out of that city, shake off the dust of your feet, don't let it bother you. Christ says, follow me forward. Keep going. Keep pressing on. Keep moving forward, promising that he will provide as we go. Shake it off. Go forward. Let God judge. Now, if you think of the example that's mentioned here, Sodom and Gomorrah, how would one of us have judged that city in that time? Maybe cruel names, maybe dirty looks, maybe ignoring them, scoffing. I mean, the, there was filth beyond comparison going on there so certainly we could have a lot of rotten things to say about them but as far as judgment goes as far as execution of righteous judgment goes there's not much we can do but what did god do <laughs> he brought fire and brimstone from heaven that destroyed that entire city and recompense was made keep this in mind when we go about trying to implement our judgments and get our last word in and 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 scoff and mock or, or, or destroy somebody that's doing wickedly. When we try to talk back and fight with somebody that refuses our words and refuses, refuses what, we are, what we are trying to bring to them, which is a gift and which is, which is the kingdom being preached. There's not much we can do for judgment in these areas, but say some words. Why don't we just let God do the judgment and handle it? Our reaction to somebody rejecting our words should be just... Kick off the dust of your feet and carry on. Follow me forth. Keep moving. Keep pressing on. Don't let yourself be distracted. Jesus says that in this time, his disciples went going house to house to house. He said it would be more tolerable for Sodom and Gomorrah than the people that would reject his disciples at this time. Do you know what Jesus is saying? He's saying, I'll judge it. I'll give recompense to those that reject you. And God handles judgment better than we ever could. So take comfort in that. Verse 16 continues on. It says, Behold, I send you forth as sheep in the midst of wolves. Be ye therefore wise as serpents and harmless as doves. You know what this is an indication of to me? That is knowing when to fight and when to flee. 
It's that fight or flight instinct. We need to know when it's time to stand up to somebody who is uh, an affront and who is in, in vile hatred of the word of God being preached and attacking people. We need to know when it's time to stand up to them. Be wise as serpents and harmless as doves in the midst of the wolves that Christ is sending you forward into. He says be wise. He says be harmless. Do you know what happens when wisdom meets harmlessness? That's called meekness. That's called having enough strength to do something about the situation and being wise enough to restrain it. That's meekness. Meekness is often looked at as weakness because somebody will get, will get mocked and spit upon and beat up. Like, look how weak that guy is. He's not even fighting back. People are pushing him around, being a bully. But sometimes it takes more strength to just do nothing in the face of bullies than it does. It takes more strength to just do nothing than it does to actually fight back. Here, wisdom meets harmlessness, and that is called meekness. We need to have meekness. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Continuing on, let's look at some things that we can apply. Verse 17, it says, Behold, we saw that, I send you forth as sheep in the midst of wolves. Verse 17 says, But beware of men. Okay, so now he's revealing that though he's giving you an example of animals, what he's actually talking about is men in this case. Beware of men, for they will deliver you up to the councils, and they will scourge you in their synagogues, and ye shall be brought before governors and kings for my sake, for a testimony against them and the Gentiles. But when they deliver you up, take no thought how or what ye shall speak, for it shall be given you in that same hour what ye shall speak. And don't be surprised if what ye shall speak in that same hour is absolutely nothing. Christ was brought before kings and governors. He was scourged in the synagogues. He was, he was brought as an astonishment and, a, and, a, and reviled before men. And he spoke not a word. That's what God gave him utterance to do. That's what God wanted Christ to do at this time. He, he fulfilled the scriptures by going as a lamb to the slaughter and spoke not a word. But we see also other indications and other times when the Apostle Paul would go before a council in the same way and they would beat him and they would mock him and they would scourge him and then he would get that opportunity to say, Men and brethren, hear me. And he would get an opportunity to say something. And I don't believe the Apostle Paul sat down and write, wrote a sermon there before he delivered it. I believe that every word that came out was just given him in that same hour what he shall speak. So we need to trust in that. Sometimes... We just ought to go dumb before our accusers. Sometimes we need to speak what the Spirit gives us utterance to speak. That's being wise as serpents and harmless as doves. God gives you what to speak. But what also I see here is God here is suggesting that we ought not to we ought not resist the delivery. He says they shall deliver you up. They shall bring you before. They shall scourge you. And the fact that he tells you that in the end there will be an opportunity to speak indicates that you're not to fight along the way. You're just to go in delivery. Something to think about here, okay? <clears throat> Jesus said, if, if my kingdom were of this world, then would my disciples fight, okay? So I'm not saying there's not some wisdom as these days get darker in preparing a few things, having a few extra food items in your, in your cabinet, your pantry, or whatever, right? Even having means of self-defense available at your, at your disposal, okay? I'm not saying there's anything wrong with that, but Jesus is clear. These are going through delivery, through uh, the worst kind of scenarios, councils and scourgings and, and governors and kings bringing them in for a testimony to the end that the testimony would go forward. God wants his people to stand before the big shots and the big wigs of this world in order that there would be a testimony against them. In order that when God judges them, they can't say, I didn't know. God needs a few laborers to be willing to go through that. <clears throat> Beware doesn't necessarily mean have fear of. It just means be aware. 
of what he's saying. Be aware of men. Don't be surprised when this happens. Be aware when you're taken away from what is comfortable to you. When you are brought to a situation where you have nothing but what God provides you. Be aware that men will desire to sift you as wheat and to destroy you in these latter days. <clears throat> but also be aware that you are taken care of in that very moment. And God is there with you. And don't fear what men shall do unto you. And don't fear what you shall say or what you shall speak. It shall be given you in that very hour, same as the power was given you to go and to preach and to give in the first place. God gives us power to overcome all of these things. Verse 20, it says, For it is not you that speak, but the Spirit of your Father which speaketh in you. Not you, but the Father that speaks. And that's a, that's a wonderful blessing. Sometimes I listen to my sermons after the fact to just see if I, if I messed it up really bad or what. And there's, there's times when, when I have revelations to myself I hadn't even thought of. Nor in the moment that I was up here had I, had I thought to display them. But, but God speaks through His own. And I believe that. He gives that inspiration in that way. And He'll do the same for you. You've been at the door, certainly. Or you've been talking to a coworker, a family member, or, uh, or somebody on, on, on the Zoom projects or whatever you're doing. And you've had these times where you just like, blah, 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 and great inspirational words come out as a result of the Spirit of your Father speaking to you and through you. It's amazing. Verse 21, And the brother shall deliver the brother to death, and the father, the child, and the children shall rise up against their parents and cause them to be put to death. These are, these are hard times that are ahead. And we can start to look at these situations that Christ is describing for his disciples as he purposely sends them with nothing and start to apply them to ourselves if we're ever in a scenario where we have nothing. Sometimes we have nothing financially and we have nothing uh, like food and provision wise and we have no shelter. We can be in those scenarios, but everybody will often have a brother or a father or children to fall back on, parents to fall back on. But here Christ is saying there's coming a time, but even the brothers will deliver you. Even your parents will deliver you. Even your children will deliver you and cause you to be put to death. Those days are coming and they are nigh. <sighs> There's a great hatred that's brewing for the things of God. And we can see it. The world is getting more and more and more just in lockstep in agreement with everything that's antichrist. Verse 22, and ye shall be hated of all men for my name's sake. But he that endureth to the end shall be saved. There's great hatred coming in these last days. But go forward and see the promises that are shown here at the end. He's not saying that we need to endure to the end to be saved, to be born again and then go to heaven. No, what he's saying, and he's actually giving two different paths for people when they enter into this time of great famine. You know what the first is? End of verse 21. Cause them to be put to death. Some of us will face death at the hands of betrayal, at the hands of people that rise up against us. What's the second route? Endure to the end. The same shall be saved from what? That death. That is here indicated in the same context. Though the hatred is the same. And all men shall revile you for the name of Christ. Some will be saved by enduring unto the end. Some will be saved and born again. But face death here in this life as a result of the hatred that comes upon them. The Bible says in Romans 13 verse 11. Now is our salvation nearer than when we believed. Isn't that true? My salvation is even closer now than it was 10 years ago. It gets nearer every moment, my salvation. I was saved 10 years ago, but my ultimate day of salvation will not be till I kick this old flesh to the curb and rise up and see, sit with Christ and see Him face to face. So whether you go out of this world by death or you go out of this world by enduring unto the end and reaching your salvation that way, either way, you can be saved. Verse 23. But when they persecute you in this city, flee into another. For verily I say unto you, ye shall not have gone over the cities of Israel till the Son of Man come. That's saying there's always another battle. 
You'll, you'll, never, you'll never talk to the last person. You'll never visit the last city. You'll never knock the last door. You'll never preach the last gospel. There's always another battle. There's always another word to go. There's always another gift to give. There's always another sermon to preach. There's always another gospel to show forth and shed light on. Go forward. Go forth. Keep pressing on. You're in good company. You're in the steps of Jesus here. Verse 24, the disciple is not above his master, nor the servant above his Lord. It is enough for the disciple that he be as his master, and the servant as his Lord. If they have called the master of the house Beelzebub, how much more shall they call them of his household? So if the Lord has been called all of these names, and he's been reviled and beaten and mocked and scourged, how much more shall he treat? How, shall they treat those that are of his household, his children, his followers? Don't think it's some strange thing when you come under persecution for the name of Christ. This whole passage of Scripture, Jesus is saying, "Go and do as I have told you," and it's not going to be an easy road. Death or faced hatred that you endure to the end. Those are basically the two paths. There's nothing new here, there's nothing unique, and there's no need to fear. There's no need to be discouraged. We need to press on. Even as Christ set his forehead steadfastly to go to Jerusalem, we need to set our forehead steadfastly to go to New Jerusalem and to see heaven. That ought to be our focus. That ought to be our, our direction and our desire. Verse 26, Fear them not, therefore. For there is nothing covered that shall not be revealed, and nothing hid that shall not be known. Truth will always prevail. And if you have the truth, if you're preaching the truth, if you're walking in the truth, you know what? You'll also always prevail. Verse 27. He says, What I tell you in darkness, that speak in light. And what you hear in the ear, that preach on the housetops. He's saying, Go and preach this same truth. Exactly what I'm telling you. Don't conceal it. Reveal it. Don't hide it. Make it known. What you've heard in darkness, proclaim that in the light. What you hear in the ear, that preach upon the housetops. Speak the truth. Verse 28, Fear them not which kill the body, but are not able to kill the soul. But rather fear him which is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. We need to properly apply our fear. And give it to whom it's due. To me, it's, it's, it's an affront to God. It's a stench in his nostrils. When I take my fear and put it to something that's less than him. When I take my fear and put it towards um, losing my job. So I'm fearing my boss. When I put it towards somebody hating me in my family. When I put it towards um, a virus. When I put it towards something that is beneath God, when I put my fear there, here in the context, it's about men. Matthew 10 and verse 28, it's about men that are trying to destroy you and hurt you and harm you and keep you from the will of God. Fear them not. What's the worst they can do? Kill the body. The, body, the Bible says absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. And that ought to be something that we look forward to and desire. They're not able to kill the soul. You're saved. You're born again. You're on your way to heaven. You will be with God whenever you breathe that last breath. But rather fear him which is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. Fear him which is above death. Which is above hell. And it's a good place to place your fear. Because the other places, you'll give them your fear. They'll seek to destroy you. And the fact that you've given them permission to make you afraid will destroy you in of itself, even if they never get a hold of you. Fear is crippling. Fear will destroy your Christian walk. Fear is the opposite of faith. Think about it. We're all afraid of a virus if we're watching too much of the news, okay? So we sit at home and we're fearful. Our health is getting worse. We're, our anxiety is going through the roof. We're getting more gray hairs. We're getting cancer as a result of the, the, the turmoil that's within us. And that virus has never come near me. But because I gave it permission to touch me, it touches me, certainly, and affects me in a real way. Don't give fear unto tangible things. Give fear unto God. 
And when you give your fear unto God, he's not going to use it to destroy you. He's going to use it to build you up. And that's what he says here in verse 28. Fear him not that can kill your body, anything tangible here, but rather fear, fear him which is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. Fear him which has a spiritual control over these things. Verse 29, it says, Are not two sparrows sold for a farthing? And one of them shall not fall on the ground without your father. But the very hairs of your head are numbered. Fear ye not, therefore, ye are of more value than many sparrows. Give God your fear, and he just places upon you value and care and love and attention. He knows so much about you that he's counted the very hairs on your head. The enemy just wants to steal, kill, and destroy. Why fear them and give them an opportunity to reach into your life? Let God reach into your life by fearing him appropriately. Verse 32, Whosoever therefore shall confess me before men, him will I confess before my Father which is in heaven. But whosoever shall deny me before men, him will I also deny before my Father which is in heaven. He will confess you in heaven if you're properly fearing him, confessing him before men, preaching of him before men, showing his works before men, being a Christian before men. He will confess you in heaven. And certainly as he does, he will bring to the Father your needs, your desires, your prayers all along the way. But those that deny him, he'll deny. He won't even make mention of. Again, why are you giving fear in this situation to someone that God is not even hearing about? <laughs> it's not even on his radar because Christ is bringing you before the throne. Don't give your fear unto another. But rather go to Christ, confess him before men, do according to his will, and allow him to confess you before the Father as a result of that. Verse 34, it continues and says, Think not that I am come to send peace on the earth. I'm not come to send peace, but a sword. I came not to send peace, but a sword. For I am come to set a man at variance against his father, and the daughter against her mother, and the daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. And a man's foes shall be they of his own household. He that loveth father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. And he that loveth son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. And he that taketh not his cross and followeth after me is not worthy of me. Christ is saying, pick up that cross and follow me. You're going to come into hardship. You're going to come into variance. You're going to come into disagreements and hatred from people that used to love you and you used to indeed show love towards. Father against the daughter-in-law and mother against the mother-in-law and, and, and the foes shall be they of your own household. But your love for them needs to be minimal, if not anything at all. Compared to hatred, Christ here complained, or compares, in comparison to the love that you have for God. Take up the cross. Follow him. Follow me, he says, forward. Despite the hardships, despite the attacks, despite everything seemingly pushing in the opposite direction as to where Christ is and where he wants you to go. He says in verse 39, He that findeth his life shall lose it, and he that loseth his life for my sake shall find it. In other words, let go of any plans and desires that you have. What you think is your life, drop it. And follow after the life that Christ gives, eternal life. Man, we come up with all sorts of plans and ideals. And even as I'm now reflecting on it, the things that I want to do with my future in five years and ten years, more and more every day it's kind of just washing away. It's becoming blurry. It's becoming less and less likely. When you see the direction that the world is going, there's no turning back. They meant it when they said new normal. It's the new world normal. I believe that 100%. There's no turn in this train around. Apart from a miracle act of God, we're not going back to normal. And the more I think about it, the more I'm like, what was normal to begin with? 
I mean, the daily grind, you know, I like my job, but what does that mean when it comes to the kingdom? My house, what does that mean when it comes to the kingdom? Everything here of this world means nothing. There's no value and no consequence to it. What was normal? I go to work, I go to family events, I look around uh, in, the, in the grocery market and, and 95% of those people don't believe on God, don't love God, don't want to serve God, don't want anything to do with the Christian way of life. So far away from Jesus, unbelievers, half of those are haters of God. They got some spite that they have against God because they grew up and someone was mean to them in a Sunday school. So they're, they're on their way towards the, the final moment when they get their last chance to choose Christ and they'll say, ah, and in hatred, turn away from him. They're on their way to that. What was the old normal? There's something better ahead. Even though it looks grim and it looks like we're going to lose a lot, and we're going to suffer a lot. And we're going to be lacking a lot. I believe that. Look at what his disciples had. No gold. No silver. No brass in their purses. No script. No paper money. They didn't have two coats. They didn't have extra shoes. They had no staves. But Christ said the workman is worthy of his meat. And in that statement, he says, hey, if you enter into the harvest and labor, I will provide for you. What does he say? Money. I will provide for you extra clothes. I will provide for you shelter. I will provide for you recompense, taking care of your enemies along the way. Just press on. Just go forward. <clears throat> At this point, the old normal is like looking back. Go forward. Press on. Verse 40, it says, He that receiveth you receiveth me. And he that receiveth me receiveth him that sent me. He that receiveth a prophet in the name of the prophet shall receive a prophet's reward. And he that receiveth a righteous man in the name of a righteous man shall receive a righteous man's reward. And whosoever shall give to drink unto one of these little ones a cup of cold water only in the name of a disciple, verily I say unto you, he shall in no wise lose his reward. There's provision here. And God is actually indicating that there's provision to those that provide for his laborers. He says here, if somebody just gives a cup of cold water to someone laboring in my word and in my vineyard and trying to get my, my, um, trying to get, trying to get my harvest brought in, that plenteous harvest brought in, if somebody is working in that fashion, preaching the kingdom is at hand, healing the sick, giving freely what he has received, if someone would just give them a cup of cold water, verily, they shall not lose their reward. This is going to be the last day's economy, I believe, is that those that would receive a prophet shall get the prophet's reward. And what does a prophet get? Clothing, food, shelter, Money, if needed. Those that receive the righteous men shall receive the righteous man's reward. God here says, follow me forward. Press on. Even when it's hard and challenging and difficulty. And I will give you all these things. And those that receive those, right, that don't turn them away but invite them into their house, shall receive of the same reward. Provision, sustenance, shelter, warmth, care. That's going to be the last day's economy. Giving water to a disciple in the name of disciple, just a cup of cold water, verily you will not use, lose your reward. Those that receive Christ, receive him that sent him. The last day's economy is going to be a time of lack, physically speaking. But to those that are spiritual, to those that are after God, workmen, they will be worthy of his meat. So, that's what we have to do. Follow him forward. Press on. Get to the harvest. Start laboring. Pray ye that God would send more laborers. 
Go to the people that Christ sent you to. Preach to them. The kingdom of heaven is at hand. Oh, it's more at hand today than it was yesterday. I see it. Heal the sick. Cleanse the lepers. Raise the dead. Cast out devils. Give as you have received. And the workman is worthy of his meat. Our only marching orders are to go and preach and go and give and do what Christ says, and he'll take care of the rest. This is, a, this is a, a wonderful passage about God's provision. What do we get when we go and we get involved in his work? Two things, persecution and provision. <laughs> you go and you preach the gospel, you're going to get persecuted. You'll also be provided for. You go and you give unto others as you have received. What do you get? Persecution, but also provided for. We're going to have to keep that in focus. I mean, I think, you know, my factory closes up its doors and and, and they're not going to build anything else and and that's it. We're all unemployed. Am I going to be going, oh, what should I do? I need to get a job. I need to go and and toil and work and do this or do that. Maybe good things to consider and do. But it also might be just a good and wise idea to go to the harvest. Be numbered with the laborers that are few. And as a workman under God, doing what Christ wanted, he'll look at me and say, he's worthy of his meat. You know what? Maybe, 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 just maybe, I'll be able to keep the house. I'll keep two coats. Keep extra shoes. Food in the pantry. My family will be cared for because I decided to get involved in labors that matter when it comes to the kingdom. Something to think about. Thank you, Jesus, for teaching.